Uh, good evening uh, to the Buddhist Society of Victoria and also to the Buddha Loka Buddhist Centre. And my name, for those who don't know me, is Ajahn Nisarano, and I'm an Australian monk who um, ordained with Ajahn Brahm in Perth uh, 20, 22 years ago for my higher ordination. And um, I've been visiting. Uh, BSV for many years, in fact, lived in, is that good? In uh, Melbourne in the 90s, and that's when I first came in contact with the Buddhist Society of Victoria. So, and I was even their librarian for one year, so that was before I ordained. <laughs> so, very good. So, this evening is another opportunity for us to meditate together. I think I need it. I feel a little tired this evening, so. It's good, a good opportunity to recharge our batteries. So this evening, I always have a theme for the evening. And this evening, I'd like to look at the hindrances to meditation. I haven't spoken about them for a long time. Uh, probably most of us, we may be experts in this area. We feel like we, we've, uh, we know pretty many, uh, pr um, pretty much know the hindrances that make our meditation difficult. But the Buddha had very good advice for it. And one of the things that is very useful to reflect too is when we get to understand these hindrances in our meditation, they, it's very helpful in our lives. Because I say to people, you know, it's not just on the meditation cushion that these things come up. They make the meditation difficult. They make our lives difficult. And if we can... Uh, understand them, can deal with them in a very skillful and a positive way in our meditation. It's conditioning us, it's allowing us to use that wisdom in our daily life. And this is, hopefully with the meditation, we should be seeing that we're taking some of the qualities we're developing in the meditation, particularly, you know, peacefulness, being in the present moment is a very useful uh, into our lives and are dealing with situations in a different way, a better way, most hopefully in a better way than before. And these uh, hindrances are part of what we call in, in Buddhism defilements. That's a larger sort of term and I've been giving talks on the three basic defilements in, in Buddhism, greed, hatred and delusion. But fortunately we also have, every human being has, non-greed, non-hatred and non-delusion as well. So it's not all negative. And really these uh, negative qualities in the mind are public enemy number one. They make for, they actually torture us and they make for unhappiness in our lives and they block peace. And the Buddha said, particularly he's talking about the five hindrances, they block wisdom as well. And and very, very much uh, the meditation allows us to develop that peace, that stability in the mind that allows wisdom to develop. Without some peace, steadiness in the mind, it's very difficult for wisdom to arise. And one of the things that's very important about these negative qualities in the mind, they're not a personal thing. Sometimes people take them personally. We should not take them personally. They have arisen due to causes and conditions. We have developed them, maybe over lifetimes even. And so when we can look at them, it's not... Some people think of them very personally. I'm an angry person, I'm a greedy person, jealous person. And they identify with these uh, negative states of mind. But these are not really personal things. They will change. We can influence them. We can develop new causes and conditions which will reduce them. And if we... Uh, manage to develop the causes and conditions for enlightenment, completely eradicate them. So this is what the stages of enlightenment do for us. You know, the first stage of enlightenment, we st the person who has attained the first stage of enlightenment sees through the idea that there's a permanent me inside, an I and a me inside. So therefore, they can really work with these states of mind, negative states of mind, even the first stage of enlightenment, still have some greed and some hatred there and a delusion there. But because they've seen, ah, there's no permanent I or me in there, I don't own these states, uh, then they can work on them. And they reduce them just by that. 
because it's this personal ownership of, of these states of mind, these negative states of mind, that really makes them difficult to work on and to let go of. So really, and I like to liken uh, meditation to, I usually use, the, uh, when I'm talking about the hindrances, the garden in the mind. But I've used that so often, <laughs> can't use that all the time. But it's also, meditation is like uh, washing the body, taking a shower or a bath for the body. It's purifying, but it's what we're aiming at in meditation is purifying the mind, removing these negative uh, qualities. You could say the sweat in the mind, the odour in the mind, the dirt in the mind, washing it off the body, washing it, washing the mind. And this is a very strong image in uh, Buddhist meditation. There's a, even the meditation manual called the Visuddhimagga, which means the path of purification. And it's looking, the whole of the, the Buddha's teaching is seen in terms of stages of purification. So, for instance, you know, when we give, this is a very important part of Buddhism, dana we call it, this is purifying this, this uh, uh, meanness or stinginess, uh, this sense of selfishness that we, we have. We're thinking of number one first, but when we give, we're thinking of others. And then we have the purification that's due to sila, due to ethical conduct. So we're letting go of negative states, negative ways of speaking and acting. And this is very good. And then we develop the mind. This is bhavana, letting go of negative states of mind developing positive states of mind. I'm always saying, develop the positive and that lets go of the negative. It's a, it's a very good way, a shortcut, I, I feel, for avoiding negative states of mind coming up, not, not allowing them the space. So this is a meditation, the purification through cleaning the mind, but also wisdom is another aspect of the Buddhist path and that really is what finally does the deep clean, <laughs> we call it deep clean, uh, the final rinse maybe, um, and leads to enlightenment. So it's the stages of purification. And you know, when we say purification, people perhaps can't relate to that, but as the mind becomes purer, brighter, clearer, um, with less of this dirt, and less of these, uh, the sweat, the, uh, the odour, body odour, then happiness comes, more and more happiness as we purify the mind and purify our, our uh, actions of body and speech and mind, all three of them. So sometimes when we are meditating and in daily life we find some of these hindrances come up. So I'd like to talk mainly about the hindrances this evening and a general way of dealing with these negative states of mind is actually the most effective way is just to recognize them, to be aware of them. When it's a bit like, um, <laughs> I think the commentaries use this simile too, that if one's aware of a thief, they will disappear, they will run as fast as they can. And that's why we have these CCTV cameras and everything, they're everywhere actually, uh, so that it deters the thieves. In the same way, you know, when we, you know, recognize a mental state for what it is, you know, particularly that it's a negative mental state, we're not getting anything out of it, and we can see it, uh, this hel helps us not to get caught up in it, not to get lost in it, which means that we can actually observe it. But that simple act of ob observation, you see it quite often in meditation, you, see, you notice something, you pay attention to it, and it disappears. The thought will disappear. It will just um, it it will disappear like the thief <laughs> out of out of the mind. So the idea with the when we're observing these things, recognizing these things, is not to to get involved with them and not to reject them. And we're in the middle ground. We're observing what's going on. But as I say, that mere ob observation, that mere recognition, often uh, means that these negative states of mind disappear by themselves. And when we see these mind, mind states coming and going, we can learn a lot because we learn 
about what I've talked about a few weeks ago, impermanence, the fact that everything is changing. We're learning that this, is, this mental state has arisen from a cause and condition. It's persisting. It will persist for a while and then disappear, pass away. And so when we, when we see this, we're developing wisdom, understanding of arising and passing away, which is a very important thing in the Buddha's teaching because it's the key to the first stage of enlightenment. And, uh, and as I often say, when we see things, uh, we don't necessarily have to be them. So this is a very useful thing. The seeing allows us a little bit of distance. We can see what's going on. We can recognize it. And because of that, we're not, we don't have to become that state of mind. So it's very, very useful. So when we're in meditation, when we're experiencing a, a negative state of mind coming up or a state, where sometimes we may not consider them negative, actually. <laughs> We, when we have a state of mind coming up that's making the meditation difficult, you know, because wanting, desire, we may think that's, oh, you know, quite nice, you know, we quite enjoy it, but it's actually disturbing, disturbing the meditation, disturbing the mind. So we're going to talk about that. But one of the things we need to find out is what, what hindrance, what sort of state of mind is running. So we can ask ourselves, what... What does it feel like? What what does the mind feel like? What's this state feel like? What kind of uh, mind state is it? And uh, if possible, I mean, this is really good, if we can know what caused it to arise. That's, that's asking a lot, actually. So if we can recognise uh, the mental states that have arisen, we can do something about them. <laughs> we can deal with them. If we don't recognise them, it's very difficult. So the Buddha talks about five basic uh, hindrances to meditation and these five are very useful to know because if you know what you're looking out for, if you know, uh, if you've seen photos of the wanted person, <laughs> then you have a good idea that when you, when you see them, ah, this is the one, <laughs> this is the one. And actually then they will often scamper anyway. <laughs> but... So it's very useful to have this sort of uh, understanding for our meditation uh, so that we, we can recognize these uh, unwanted states of mind, but maybe. Um, so in essence, the first one is called sense desire, and this is desire connected to our five senses, also to, uh, to a certain extent thinking about the five senses. Uh, the Buddha calls it karma chanda. And it's this wanting in the mind to get, this desire, is very uh, craving and delighting. It's very similar to what we call the, it comes from, the root uh, defilement of greed, wanting, you know. Um, and it, what, what it does is it's taking our attention outside of ourselves because this wanting, these sense desires are usually outside of ourselves. And in meditation, it can be, you know, we can be thinking about sport, the cricket, the latest uh, results in the cricket or the tennis or whatever it is. It can be to do with, you know, what, what we had for a meal last week and how pleasant it was listening to that music, that uh, the concert that we went to the week before, you know, many things. It's just anything that's reference uh, is focused on our five sense experience. And of course, it's not, usually it's not in the present moment. It's to do with the past. Or we often go off into the future. Oh, we're going to have a wonderful Italian meal tomorrow evening. And it would be very nice to be with friends. That sort of thing uh, we focus on. And it can also be concerned with the comfort of the body too, particularly um, for the meditation, you know, we want to make the body as comfortable as possible. Um, and fortunately, I think this is very, very good. We've got very good cushions here and the conditions are good. The temperature is, is very helpful. So this is another thing that often disturbs the meditation when we, we're constantly trying to find a more comfortable position. And the idea at the beginning of the meditation is, of course, set it up so that we find 
a comfortable and stable position we can hold so that the body doesn't disturb us as we meditate, so that it doesn't become our focus for the meditation. So it's important to have a comfortable position before we sit and, uh, or walk meditation. And for that reason, sitting on a chair is no problem at all. Um, because, as one of my teachers said, it's, meditation is uh, mental work. It's not body work. So the body can be a bit of a hindrance, but if we make it as comfortable as possible before we start the meditation, it need not become the focus of the meditation in the sense of being uncomfortable or painful. So these are very uh, common things that... Uh, we're concerned with it can even you know this wanting can take the form of wanting uh we can have a to-do list in the meditation i want first jhana i want second jhana i want to develop deep peace i want a lot of joy happiness i, I want some insights you know this insight that insight so it can it can take on that form too it's uh, a bit like um spiritual materialism in a way but it's, um, and they are, they are good things to want, but in actual fact, when we want things like those, it really blocks them. If we expect these things, then it will tend to block that experience happening. And as Ajahn Brahm often says, you know, with meditation, all we need to do, and this is a hard bit, is to get out of the way. <laughs> and that's not easy to do, actually. It's very hard for us to do, get out of the way. And we tend to uh, get in there and uh, stir things up. And the Buddha had an a image for this sense desire, and he said it's like a, a bowl of water that's coloured by dye. And it's uh, similar, uh, similarly... Um, desire, this desires, various types of desires in the mind, colour the mind and we see, only see the attractive aspect of what we desire. And it's a very interesting teaching because it has implications for our lives that in actual fact a lot of our desires I mean, can be for another person are really just an image in our mind that we've, we have focused on, we've created to a large extent. And uh, we've seen the attractive things that we want to pay attention to. And it's good to see that, that often this is a mental thing, actually, uh, that has, uh, may not have that much to do with <laughs> the object, the original object. So, and the Buddha suggested the antidotes for this are paying, uh, t uh, contemplating the unattractive qualities of what we desire, whatever it be, you know, and uh, this... This can be very effective because, as I mentioned, if we have a mental projection, all we need to do is add something to that mental projection, that image we have in our mind, that makes it unattractive. And then the mind will regain its balance, it'll let go. It's quite interesting to see, actually, that uh, this is really you know, where we can make quite a difference just by changing our image, this this attractive image we have in the mind, whether it be for a person, a thing, whatever it is, um, that can be very useful. And uh, another thing the Buddha recommended is looking at the disadvantages uh, of that particular desire or desire in general, so that uh, then we can let go of it. You know, that it's causing us, when we have desire, this feeling, immediate feeling of lack, immediate feeling of we... We need this to be happy, want this to be... And once we have it, then we'll be happy. And then once we get whatever we want, then we know there'll be another desire coming, so it'll keep us from running. Um, and another thing we can do with desire, a very useful one, is to contemplate its impermanence. So if you're in the shops and you're looking at something and then you, you think, oh, how will it look in five years' time? This smartphone looks great now. And maybe in five, year time, five years' time, you won't even be able to use it because it will be an old model and uh, no doubt, uh, you know, obsolescent and also maybe you're broken down by then. So, so it's a quite good, you know, way of letting go of things when we can see the impermanence, which will eventually happen, will eventually happen. 
So it can bring the mind, and also we can bring the mind gently back to the present moment, let go of that desire, um, and let go of the thoughts. Because when we let go of uh, the pre when we let go of the past and the future, a lot of desire is cut out. Because just when you're meditating, not a huge amount to desire really. And the other big hindrance uh, for meditation and for our lives, the first two are the big ones: the uh, uh, karma chanda, the sense, sensual desire, sense desire, and the second one, aversion. These are the two things that really in a sense, run the world. <laughs> the world we experience outside as well as the world inside. So it's, if we can come to terms with these two things, we are, you know, our wisdom, our understanding, we can develop more peace and happiness in our lives because we understand two big motivators for the world. Uh, we, in, uh, as I mentioned, with, like greed and hatred, actually running the world in a very big way. And they're facilitated by, made possible by, delusion that thinks that these states will actually in some way, well, greed bring happiness and uh, usually aversion or hatred, that we're right to be angry, to be averse to this person, to this situation, whatever it is. But this aversion or uh, we see in uh, meditation in hind as a hindrance can be Aversion, anger, they often call it ill will. Some of these words, ill will, I think is not a common English word. actually, <laughs> But it's a resistance in the mind. It's a really a rejection in the mind of what we're experiencing or whatever it be, whether it be a person or a situation. Uh, in the meditation, it can be uh, a resistance to what we're experiencing, rejection. If we, we feel we're not getting peaceful, <laughs> We can, it can get uh, this sort of aversion to what we're experiencing. And it can, it's also can be experienced as fear and uh, depression as well, these uh, negative states of mind. And uh, that's where the mind takes, uh, reacts with dislike to either an, uh, an unpleasant external thing or an, un, in, an unpleasant internal condition, either. When we have the sense desire, when the mind's attracted, then it's like a pleasant feeling often that we're attracted by, uh, whether it be an external one, usually an external one, yeah. So, and the, what arises when we have this negative feeling, this aversion, we want to get rid of it. This is, this is the rejection, resistance to it. And it can be externally somebody, it can be a noise, it can be pain, it can be many things. And internally, uh, it can be uh, negativity towards ourselves, our meditation. My, te my meditation sucks. <laughs> it's terrible. You know, it's, I can't meditate these things, you know. Uh, or a state of mind, you know, we can get very averse to what we experience. If we're bored, you know, in meditation or uh, restless, restlessness, restlessness, this sense of not being able to settle is very unpleasant. So... And the Buddha likened this to some water um, in a bowl that's boiling because it's a very hot state of mind, an uncomfortable state of mind. How do we um, deal with that? And of course, the classic way is to have this loving kindness, which includes a sort of sense of acceptance and forgiveness and compassion towards ourselves and whatever we're experiencing. So in that way, we avoid, you know, in creating that dynamic of getting into a battle with a, with a negative state of mind that we're experiencing. I don't want this negative state of mind. And uh, that just creates more of this, you know, state of mind and really increases it. So this loving kindness just accepts it as it is. <laughs> it's here now. And it has this um, quality of friendliness to it and openness. And so... Uh, it can allow a negative state of mind to to be, and once that's uh, that uh, dynamic is established, then that state may dissipate. Of course, we don't. We uh, if we have the idea, well, I'll use loving kindness to get rid of it. <laughs> that's not loving kindness. <laughs> it's not. That's a deal. <laughs> And there's also a bit more of aversion in there, really. I still want to get rid of it. 
So we can have, you know, feelings we can use for loving kindness, thoughts, may I be free of resistance and negativity, may I be happy and at peace with myself and the world, things like this. So these are ways we can deal with uh, these negative states of mind, aversion and so on. There are other ways too that we can just recognize it as what it really is, is unpleasant feeling and not react to it. That can have, that can be quite an insight that it's just unpleasant feeling, either coming from a physical source, maybe an ache or a pain in the body, or from a mental source, a state of mind that we don't like. And just to recognize it can actually be very useful. Um, uh, and then we can accept it. Uh, be, uh, we can use acceptance to, to uh, just to let it be and real, recognize it, understand it then it's just an unpleasant feeling and that it will pass. This is the nature of all experience. Yes, so, and pain is a very good example of that, you know, if we can, um, as I say, everybody, nobody likes pain, so they tend to be averse to it and want to get rid of it. But if we can use some, uh, we can relax that area, use some kindness towards that area, sometimes breathing through that, uh, mentally breathing through the pain uh, that can reduce. And often it's not very useful to focus on pain. Sometimes you hear about people doing this, Dukkha Vedana practice, but you need to have quite a lot of stability in the mind to do a practice like that so you're not reacting we're not reacting negatively to what we're experiencing otherwise it makes the meditation extremely unpleasant <laughs> and we we won't uh, we won't develop that wisdom so pain is a very good one to use um, relaxing to use relaxation to use meta towards um, but eventually if we find that it's too much then we can mindfully uh, change our posture. Um, and uh, that's, so that's a, uh, pain is something we, we have to deal with in life. So this is a very useful thing to, to understand. And, uh, you know, as I say, some people make this their practice, Dukkha Vedana. But usually those people have got a very good, <laughs> if they can make use of it, meditation practice so that um, this uh, pain is not overwhelming. They know that they can, there's an escape from pain into deep meditation. So it's, um, it's something uh, that it's best really to watch the states of mind that react to the pain rather than stay with the pain, to see our resistance in the mind and use that. The next one uh, is uh, sleepiness and sluggishness I've got here, um, which includes boredom, and this is tinamida, and this is when the body and the mind are very tired, the body very heavy, the mind very stiff. The Buddha often likened it to being in prison, being in prison because you can't move. Uh, the, the mind is very narrow, very dull, uh, very confined, it's a very sleepy state. It is somewhat pleasant. It can be somewhat pleasant in the sense that it's fairly dull, but, but not too unpleasant. But there's no brightness and energy in the mind with these states. And I have heard people tell me, and you may have experienced this yourself, I have, how fast the meditation can go. You know, oh, I didn't know, notice it was 45 minutes an hour. But when you ask yourself, what were you aware of? Well, not much. <laughs> so this means, isn't it, that it's a sleepy state of mind, not, not an alert state of mind. Because if we are alert, we'll know what's happening. We'll be aware and there'll be energy in the mind. So in this case, it's probably that we were actually drifting off, drifting off. Sometimes we hear people drifting off quite loudly here. <laughs> So you can hear the snoring. But uh, the Buddha likened this also to a bowl of water that's covered with algae, you know, this water plant on top of the water so that you can't see into it. And how to deal with that? Well, we can arouse energy, if this is possible to arouse energy. If we're physically tired, this is quite good. Um, 
by making, uh, giving more attention to the posture. You know, so if we, because if you if you slouch, that really, that really enables um, sleepiness. So if we give a little bit more uh, alertness to the posture, not tension, we can have light on. We can meditate with the light on, and we can meditate with our eyes open. Or we can do other forms of meditation, walking meditation, or a more active form of meditation like uh, my, uh, med, uh, loving kindness meta meditation. Um, or uh, we can briefly have a, a nap and then uh, have a bit of a rest and then come back when the energy picks up. Because usually it will pick up after the mind has had a little bit of a rest and uh, then it will come back with energy is something that passes. It's very funny. Well, it's not funny, actually. It's really unpleasant to see when somebody is nodding. And I've seen some super nodding <laughs> in my time in Thailand. You know, where people will be... They're, they're really drowsy and their head can go almost to the floor and then come back up. And it's really amazing. It really, to see it is just extraordinary. You think, my God, they'll do damage to themselves. <laughs> And I know uh, Anjan Brown's famous story about this one is that, you know, uh, he was when he was in Thailand as a young monk at a place called Wat Pa Nanachat, northeast Thailand, uh, he was told, you, you are nodding. And he, and, uh, and he knew he was nodding because they had these all-night sits, you know, on the full moon, well, the moon days once a week that have sit or meditation the whole night. And uh, so they get very drowsy during this. And so they came up with this uh, w this uh, way to show to let them know if they were if they were uh, getting sleepy. They put a matchbox on top of their head, open, and then if if they really were getting drowsy or nodding, it would fall on the on the onto the the floor, and they would know. Ah, oh, yeah, I'm dr I'm I'm uh, you know getting sleepy, and it would wake them up. But Ajahn Brahm did this and he was very pleased because it wasn't falling off at all. And then somebody said, Aha, uh -huh, Ajahn Brahm, do you know what you're doing? He said, No. He said, I saw. This other person saw, the other monk saw. He said, You're moving forward and back like this, but your head is not going down. <laughs> so the box was staying there, but he was still. <laughs> so it's amazing, isn't it, what the mind can do? So it's. So that didn't work for him. <laughs> so he's, uh, as a result of that, he's not very keen on these all-night type sits that people do, you know, because it encourages that uh, drowsiness and uh, um, uh, those sluggishness in the mind, tiredness in the mind. And sometimes it can be due to boredom that we're sleepy and uh, uh, drowsy, you know. So this is a mental state, and we. Uh, in those those occasions, we can just bring up some loving kindness for for what we're experiencing and warmth for ourselves, because this is like a, a negative state of mind, aversion, really, that we want to be out of the present moment. So we're in, you know, la la land. We call it, you know, just nodding off, going to, into this sort of half awareness. So I better quickly go through the rest. So we also have restlessness and worry. These are the things that people are probably very uh, familiar with. Agitate, agitated states of mind that either repeat the same thought over and over again like an endless loop or, uh, you know, are looking for something uh, that restlessness is often looking for something to satisfy oneself and then moving on to the next thing, the next thing not finding anything to satisfy ourselves. And it's too much energy in the mind, too much. The other one, too little energy in the mind. This is too much, and it lacks that sense of contentment, being in the, just being present with what we're experiencing, being content with what we're experiencing. And usually it can be, as I say, restlessness, but there's another state as, that goes with it um, that's a little different, is worry or anxiety. And that's usually worrying about what we've done and said in the past. And they're all, in essence, states where we are finding fault with what we're experiencing. Um, and so they're sort of state, negative states of mind that just cannot settle. And the Buddha likened this, to the hind this hindrance to a wind which is whipping up 
are the little waves on the water in a bowl. And how do we deal with that? Well, first of all, if we are aware of it, that's quite good. And we can recognize, oh, this is restlessness, this is worry. And uh, if we can accept it with patience and tolerance, that it's, you know, it's here, it's arrived, I recognize it, and then sometimes it will go by itself. And another uh, way that the Buddha recommended was to focus on something peaceful or calming. That's very useful. So the breath is quite a calm thing, but we could use peace on the in-breath and peace on the out-breath, or alternatively thinking of um, something very peaceful, a peaceful image, like a, a Buddha statue, your favourite Buddha statue, or other statues, um, or a beautiful natural scene which will calm the mind down. So very good, very useful. And with restlessness and worry, this is, as I said, fault-finding too. It's an aversion to you know the, uh, something we've done and said actually um, or it can be and it can be a number of things uh, it can be about our, our meditation too fault finding can be about our meditation and ourselves and what we need then is to develop sort of a loving kindness for uh, ourselves and especially in the form of forgiveness if it's a worry or um, uh, worry about something we've done and said forgive ourselves for not being perfect and also to develop contentment is very useful so I use mantras like happy to be here I'm so lucky or everything is fine that's okay and the last hindrance a uh, very important one is doubt and uh, this is can be doubt about um, what we're doing, and particularly, you know, meditation. What is this meditation business about? <laughs> you know, does it really work? Is it all they say it is? You know, and it can be a doubt about how to do it too. Because when we first come to meditation, we often spend a good deal of our time saying, "What do they say?" He said, "Oh, he said something. Yeah, do I do this now or do that?" So we can be spend a lot of time doubting about what we're doing, and uh, or the other thing that we can have doubt about is our own ability to meditate. So sometimes people say to me, I, I, I don't think I can meditate at all. You know, I was thinking all the time. And I said, well, that's good. You've got an insight into what the mind is doing. So that's the... But people can have doubts about their, their, me, the, their ability to do things. And the Buddha likened this to a bowl of water that's full of mud, but it's stirred up. So it, it makes things very, very unclear. And how to deal with it? Of course, to ask uh, someone who's got experience, a teacher, or someone has more experience in meditation, that can usually help. But also to develop some sort of confidence uh, by reflecting that this meditation business has enabled people to become enlightened over the last 2,500 plus years. So, and, and for, some, for people to develop happier lives, be more peaceful and fulfilled so then to build more more sort of confidence in it and that it is a natural process it's, it doesn't rely everybody can do it it's just a matter of whether they want or whether they put the time into it they're patient with themselves with their minds and it's just a matter of persevering and not giving up that's Ajahn Brahm's big message is always when people say, you know, they have their meditation hasn't developed, you know, and they don't think it's... He said, not yet. <laughs> so it's only a matter of time if we put the energy into keep persevering with it. So there are the uh, five hindrances. As I mentioned, sensual desire or sense desire, aversion, sleepiness and drowsiness or sluggishness as I used, restlessness and worry, uh, and the last one, doubt. Um, so this covers uh, most of the, the negative states of mind that come up. Fear, for instance, comes up in aversion, dealing with aversion. So loving kindness is a very good way to deal with fear. So now it's time for the meditation, otherwise the evening will completely disappear, just talking. And... So we, now we'll meditate for about 45 minutes. It might be good just to stand up for a moment or two and then stretch the legs, as we say, and then we can sit down. Ooh.
So now you have all the information about some of the the most wanted the most wanted criminals <laughs> for meditation. So it should be easier to recognise them and maybe to use some of these things if necessary. But we don't we only need them when they're necessary. Don't otherwise it will disturb the meditation. But if they are coming up again and again, then it's good to use some of these antidotes to the uh, hindrances, the negative states of mind that can come up. So first of all, now we can just make, find, uh, adjust the body, find a comfortable position on the cushion or the seat and just check out how the body is. And we can close our eyes because that way we can become more aware of the body and you know the position of the head balancing it on the shoulders over the shoulders the shoulders are comfortable and we feel quite stable uh, sitting on the cushion on the chair and the back is reasonably uh, straight reasonably straight but not rigid not tense and our hands can be either on our laps or uh, on our knees, however we find most comfortable. And so for this meditation, I thought that we can have uh, perhaps the intention to make peace with whatever we experience, to make peace. This is like uh, metta meditation, really, loving kindness, making peace with what we experience in the body, in our bodies, and in our minds. Making peace, not getting involved with it. And having, uh, seeing what this feeling, of, if a feeling comes up when we think of making peace with things, so that we don't get caught up in a battle fight with them, we're accepting them, allowing them, making peace. And now we can start by relaxing the body mentally starting at the top of the head, making peace with whatever we experience, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, around the top of the head, the sides of the head, the back of the head. And moving our attention down the forehead, soothing and relaxing as we go, and around the eyes, and the cheeks of the face and around the lips, the mouth, the chin, just relaxing, soothing, making peace with whatever we're experiencing and moving the attention down to the neck or around the neck. Soothing and relaxing. And bringing to mind the right shoulder, starting at the neck and moving along the right shoulder with this uh, mental massage. Then bringing to mind the right arm, starting at the top of the arm and moving down the right arm to the elbow, the wrist, the hand and fingers, just slowly moving down the right arm, relaxing, soothing any tight areas, any tense areas, any painful areas. With this making peace, this kind, warm attention.
Now bringing to mind the left shoulder and moving along the left shoulder with our attention, relaxing it, easing any tight areas, any tense areas, sore areas, letting go of the burden. Now we can bring to mind the left arm and starting at the top of the left arm we can move our attention down the left arm right down to the fingertips just slowly soothing, relaxing giving this warm, kind attention Relaxing the whole left arm down to the hand and the fingers. And now we can bring to mind the back starting just below the shoulders and move, we can move our attention down the back slowly, relaxing and releasing, soothing with our attention. Relaxing the whole of the back, from the shoulders right down to the buttocks. And now we can bring to mind the front of the body and move our attention down the front of the body down the chest, the, uh, down to the stomach area and abdomen, just the whole of the front of the body, soothing, relaxing, making peace as we move down from the shoulders down the front of the body. Relaxing the whole of the front of the body. Now we can bring to mind the right leg, starting at the top of the leg, and move our attention slowly down the leg to the knees, the ankle, and the foot and toes. Just slowly moving down with this soothing, warm attention.
making peace with whatever we experience in the right leg. Now we can bring to mind the left leg, starting at the top of the left leg and moving our attention slowly down the left leg all around and taking in the knee, the lower left leg, the ankle, the left foot and toes, just moving slowly down the left leg, soothing, mentally massaging the left leg. Relaxing the whole of the left leg. And now we can become aware of the whole of the body just sitting here. Making peace with the body as it is, with this kind, warm attention. Just sitting here in the present moment. No past. No future. Just here in this oasis of the present moment. Experiencing whatever we are aware of, sounds, feelings in the body, temperature of the air. Just being aware of them without having to label them identify them, just being aware of them, just being a part of the present moment that's happening now. making peace with whatever we experience.
we become aware of the breath or the breath comes to us, we can notice it and breathe in with peace in mind and breathe out with peace in mind. Breathing in peace and breathing it out. this feeling of making peace as we breathe in and making peace as we breathe out.
can be aware of what uh, we have developed in the meditation, the feeling, maybe more peacefulness, more clarity, more stillness, more calm, or some understanding, wisdom. And we can share this, spread this to everyone here in the hall, wishing that they can make peace with whatever they're experiencing. we can spread this further beyond the hall to this area, spreading it further and further so that we can cover the whole of Melbourne for the welfare and of all the beings, human beings, animals, whatever beings that they can find this peace, make peace, sharing with them this energy we've developed in the meditation. And enlarging it further and further to the whole of Victoria, to all those that have been affected by the fires, those that have died, the people and the animals, and enlarging it further to cover the whole of Australia and all the beings that have been affected by fire. Spreading this energy of peace and clarity, wisdom, making peace with the difficulties that all beings experience from time to time and spreading it further afield, radiating it beyond Australia to all around the world, to all the beings there. and radiating it to beings in all realms of existence, wherever they are. They may have this energy of peace, wisdom, making peace with the experiences in their life. And we can develop the wish to develop more of this making peace with every, in every aspect of our lives, not just the meditation. And we can anchor this feeling of making peace in our hearts, in our minds. So that we can return to it any time, day or night. And lastly, we can check up on how we feel now. Is it different from the beginning of the meditation? Am I feeling more peaceful, more balanced, more bright, more aware? Am 
and was I able to make peace with what I experienced, the pleasant, the unpleasant and the neutral things I experienced. And now we can slowly come out of the meditation, moving our bodies to make them more comfortable and slowly opening the eyes. So now we can just, I can usually ask, are there any comments, questions or complaints? That people had any comments from this evening's meditation? Ah, very good. It's always my test <laughs> of how the meditation has gone. So uh, usually there are, aren't any comments or questions at the end of the meditation. That's a good sign, actually, usually a good sign that we have, uh, you know, had a peaceful meditation, that thinking has reduced. And this is something that's uh, very valuable for us because it gives the mind a rest, you know, from all the thinking, you know, all the liking, reacting to things and all these uh, all the experiences that we have. So this is how we make the mind stronger, is by resting it, by, by developing the stability and this peace in it, and using that for looking at what we experience in life, because then we can see things more clearly. Things are not, our minds are not uh, moving so fast that we can't take, can't see what's happening. We can't see, we, so we can see into things clearly. Oh, there are. Right. There's one online question. Oh, one online Actually. question. All right. One online From question. New Zealand. From New Zealand, yes, good. When meditation gets disturbed by strong emotions, yes. can we use thinking in the form of logic to bring the mind back to reality? Ah. Can we use thinking in the form of logic to bring us back to reality uh, when we have strong emotions? I think... You can, I think, <laughs> you can try it and see. You can try it and see. I usually uh, logic, thinking logically, and emotions don't, don't go together. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, it's usually, usually it's it's uh, understanding that what the emotional state needs, uh, what what will answer that. Uh, that is is useful, but if the logic works, I mean, you can try it and see, you know. Um, but as I say, uh, it's like two different modes of existence: our know, logical mind, our thinking mind, and the feeling mind. A little bit, uh, quite a bit, quite a bit different. So if we're upset, you know, or um, uh, um, upset, disturbed, then you know, this sort of loving kindness to bring in a a warm emotion for ourselves, a kindness towards ourselves. That, that's very helpful. Um, you can try the logic and see if that works, but usually bringing up uh, some sort of uh, uh, emotion that, that soothes oneself um, can calm these negative states of mind down. That's what I would, would advise, you know. Um, and it can be not only you know, uh, meta, we said, people probably think, he's always saying, use meta, use meta. Hasn't he got anything else? <laughs> uh, but you can use karuna, this is compassion, you know, kindness and compassion for ourselves because we are suffering this emotion, the strong emotion. Or we can use equanimity, you know, this ability to just, 
to uh, to have this sort of it's, uh, equanimity is not indifference. It's just it's, it's loving kindness, but just realizing that you know maybe the mind is a bit out of control at the moment, and uh, just allow having this sort of acceptance for what we're experiencing. Because um, often it's just the rejection of what we're experiencing. Because it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant. So these different approaches can be uh, can be useful for dealing with strong emotions. And uh, it reminds me of Ajahn Brahm's uh, simile of Nalagiri. Nalagiri was an elephant at the time of the Buddha. That um, when his uh, cousin Devadatta was trying to take over the Buddha Sangha. And uh, one of the strategies he used to get the Buddha out of the way was he got the king at the time to allow uh, his workers to get this elephant drunk, gave it alcohol, and beat it and everything. And then when the Buddha and his, his uh, monks were coming for arms round, coming for their food with their bowls into the village, the idea was to open the the stable doors and let this elephant rush out and crush the Buddha to death and therefore Devadatta would then succeed he would be I don't know people wouldn't be very impressed I don't think but anyway he he did they did this and they released the elephant and it charged out of the stable absolutely angry and uh, out of control and headed straight for the Buddha and Venerable Ananda his assistant stood in the way of the Buddha to protect I don't know how he's going to protect the Buddha that way and and uh, uh, the Buddha said, no need, Ananda, no need. So he stood aside and the Buddha just radiated uh, metta, loving kindness, towards this drunk and uh, maddened elephant. And they say the elephant came and slowed down, slowed down, until it got to the Buddha and it actually knelt down at the Buddha's feet. And people were amazed. But this is the power of loving kindness. And in Ajahn Brahm simile, he says sometimes our minds are like Nalagiri, this drunk and wild elephant. And we just have to let it be, let it go, but have this loving kindness towards it. And then the energy of that disturbance, that strong emotion, eventually will run down, will eventually dissipate. And we give ourselves emotional first aid, as I call it, so this is how I would see, you know, dealing with strong emotions. I think it's, a, it's called fighting fire with fire, <laughs> which uh, it has to be the like, I think, emotion. So I think now is, uh, yes, uh, that's good. So I think in the end, you know, for the person in New Zealand, whatever works, and it's true for our meditation, you know, if something works for us to bring more peace, more wisdom, more stillness, clarity, awareness in the mind, this is going in the right direction. And we know um, that this is useful, is useful for our meditation, so, and useful for our lives. Um, and as I say, particularly understanding these negative hindrances in, in our lives and in our meditation, very important, very useful to, as I say, once we we see the wanted person, we recognize them, and they will usually head off, they'll scamper. And, um, and this can improve the quality, not only of our meditation, but our lives, because we're understanding where our lives are coming from, <laughs> which is from our minds, from our, the way we perceive the world. It's very much the experience we have of it. So if we purify that mind, if we reduce the negative, qualities in the mind, increase the positive qualities in the mind, then the world that we experience will be of a very similar nature. It will be much more positive, much more bright, and less um, negative, or the negative side will decrease. So in that way, we can enhance not only our meditation, but our experience of life. So I'd like to finish here and uh, um, thank you all for coming this evening. It's quite warm, isn't it, now? It's quite warm. <laughs> I'm getting toasty. <laughs> um, and very nice to meditate together because it adds a special energy when we meditate together. And next Monday night uh, we have another opportunity to meditate together. So look forward to that. All right, good night. And those who would like to, we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. <coughs>